So this coiling mechanism where you sometimes get very low volatility and it gets super tight is natural to happen just before a key fence has to be jumped. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics and excited today because we have a new guest on the show, although someone that I think many of you are familiar with, who is Francis Hunt, the market sniper. And obviously, we talk a lot on the show about the fundamental reasons for gold and silver, the value of sound money in a world where we have a lot of fiat, often getting expanded at disturbing rates and now, as we're in the midst of seeing what happens when you remove some of those policies, um, fortunately, we'll be able to dig into some of the technicals and trading patterns that Francis is an expert and digs through. And interesting because he is also a sound money advocate, but also approaches some of these things on a shorter term basis as well. So, Francis, it's a pleasure to finally catch up with you. I know we've been setting this one up for a while, but a lot to dig into, especially with some very volatile markets that unfortunately, I think in many ways have people quite concerned these days because we're now seeing the effects of what happens when you undo the easy money. So with all that said, welcome in. Great to have you here. And how are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. Thank you for the invite, Chris. Delighted to be put in front of your uh, Sound Money Advocates audience as well. Welcome and hi to all of them too. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here and perhaps a good place to start before we dig into some of the technicals is just in terms of mindset, when you have an underlying fundamental view and believe in the, the value of sound money, yet you're also trading it, how do you keep those two buckets separately so you can still be making good decisions in terms of the trading patterns and also, uh, I know you're a stacker of gold and silver and how do you keep those two separate so you can proceed well going forward? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, my general thesis is you, you almost have to think of it a bit like a pyramid. The investment base must be your biggest base uh, inherently. Uh, people that just go, hey, I don't have any investments. I don't have much cash, but I'm going to swing a big invest, uh, you know, leverage line on something short term. That is really an inverted pyramid. That's the wrong way to go. You need a you need a good base of investment. I think it was um, Dr. John Demartini that said that most people psychologically can tolerate around 10 percent swings in their total net worth. And before it starts uh, getting a little bit emotive, there'll be some people that'll be a bit less than that. I've because of a risk profile and many years in the game, I probably uh, in my early days swung a little more than that. Uh, not that it was a smart thing to do. Um, but beyond that, you start to feel, you know, if you're worth a million dollars and you're now worth 900,000, you're not hanging yourself. But if, it, if, if, if you, you know, if you, if you knock it back down to half a million or 400,000 when you were worth a million dollars, that's just a, a really bad day or bad week or bad month. So inherently, you should start with the investment layer. And uh, that's the stacking side uh, with reference to uh, metals, which is why I'm certainly part uh, of that. Uh, and I think you could continue to do that part and continue to build your base. The bigger the foundation, the bigger the home you get to build on it. But you'll notice that, you know, as you go higher up, buildings generally taper. So leverage is almost like the capstone of uh, the pyramid. You have to earn the right to leverage because leverage uh, makes things a lot more uh, wild and schizo. And if you don't um, enact preservation of capital, which means you've got to have mechanisms to close trades if you're wrong. And you've got to enter everyone, no matter how much certainty you feel psychologically, you can inherently be wrong. How many times have we all thought this is the big move that's now taking us to $3,000 gold, et cetera, et cetera. You've needed a patience of a monk. So adding leverage longs on your gold because you feel you're a little small on the base, uh, it can be pretty fatal. And when then we get bitter and then we say, oh, look what they've done. They've slammed us at the 2000 mark again. Well, that was once the 1000 mark, by the way. So we are making progress. But nonetheless, you've you've got to you've really got to be a student of the markets. You've got to have method. You've got to have really tight capital risks and then outlier gains. So it's always the asymmetry trade that interests me. 
um, not the 50-50. People love a 50-50. They want to say, oh, let me be clever. I'll take a view, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's the absolute asymmetries and preferably in the risk, which is why we we have the hunt volatility funnel where, where volatility gets very, very low. Stops can be tight. Most people get stopped out all the time as they, their stop placement is a bit too tight. So there's a lot in the methodology for trading. Don't I wouldn't like anyone watching this who's a stacker to wade into trading for the first time and start, you know, aggressively going for it without methodology and true understanding and a bit of practice where you're losing a burger and a Coke and you're winning a good dinner out for you and your partner uh, at that level. Once you've done that, then you can start pushing the boat out a little more. So uh, there's some quite a bit of caution uh, in that message delivery if, if that works for you. Yeah, I think that's well said. and perhaps in in many cases having good trading and money management practices almost goes as far if not more far than the actual trades that we're putting on and especially with gold and silver which i know we tend to be a bit of an emotional crowd yeah. especially because many people get to it because they see some of the things that whether we call it the injustices of the world or the concerns of what's happening as the money is being expanded and certainly uh as I got into gold and silver, perhaps I maybe went a little bit overboard. I'm a former options trader, so see some of these happening, things happening, and um, well said to put things in content, at, at context, and certainly not being in a position where you're over levering yourself. Um, now, you did mention in there the two thousand dollar level, which once upon a time was the one thousand dollar level. Obviously, some key levels in silver are. The $50 level, which a lot of people think about, we've certainly talked about, and perhaps also $30. So some key levels that people look at, and one of which we hit back on Friday with gold briefly crossing over $2,000 an ounce. Curious from a technical perspective, what, what do you see there where we've now had uh, three or four times where gold has crossed over 2000 has come back down under different environments where a couple of years ago it was in the middle of quantitative easing and our 0% interest rates now with a much higher interest rate. But what do you see when we have gold crossing 2000 at a 5% interest rate, yet at the same time people are starting to notice some of these debt levels uh, might be a problem and not just the gold and silver crowd anymore, but even more mainstream concerns. So maybe we could start there with gold at 2000 and, and how you put all that together in your trading. Absolutely. Yes, happily. Um, I think it was Lionel Richie that said uh, once, twice, three times a lady. And then I would say, well, fourth time after a hairy ass man storming upside of the 2000 uh, level. So uh, I've, I've actually got it on a lower time frame just to explain the recent spike. But I think what you're referencing is the multiple uh, iterations of uh, interplay with the 2000 which captured which is captured in this screen view uh, over here and uh, it's very typical of price behavior three is actually a bit of a magic number for us uh, in our technical methodology with the hvf method the hunt volatility funnel method which is trading low volatility uh, and it's it's one of the it's the first and smallest subset also for elioticians so they have the a b c d you know the up down and go so there, there is there's a degree of uh fascination with that level that's your first interaction by the way that was the cv19 events when it occurred you literally spilled and then shook it off it was very quickly over we had the short oil long gold during that period and it was very beneficial that's your first this is your second ironically the deeper pullback actually occurred after the second attempt, you could see we made a lower low here, but then there was a real hard floor. These things are what we call uh, buying up wicks. You see the three uh, little stubble hairs there that are pointing out the bottom. That's rejection each time. Three times it was rejected and then it made it up here. We started to get a bit tired here. You could see the selling wicks in much the same way and a bit of a broadening structure on the third time. And we were saying, again, it looks like it's not going to hold. Um, so, you, you, you know, you test three times, 
uh, and then the fourth time you break with momentum. So in my opinion, I actually think that there's a decent chance that the next significant major move is going to be the one. Now, how many times have gold and silver bugs had to listen to that? Um, I'm going to give you a technical justification for it, but I'm sure many will go, yeah, 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 I don't uh, believe you. But uh, eventually the wolf comes. Uh, if you cry wolf too many times, people don't take you seriously, but eventually the wolf does indeed come. Uh, and I think that 2000K break, uh, we stopped just short of it. And I want to highlight the degree of momentum that actually came. So we we did take a tactical short trade on silver. You mentioned that actually, I think, in our adjustment. And that was, again, small. Remember, we big stack of silver. This is not an anti thing. If we think something's going to throw it down, we uh, are prepared to even to stack further silver to let them play with the price as they want to and take what we think is coming. And you did get quite a big breakdown. Uh, as a result of that uh, on the gold we're looking at gold market now um, and then eventually you got to that 1820 and again you just saw there was the again there's the rejections to go much lower it didn't seem to want to run the previous low over there and then the momentum and the degree that you then subsequently engulfed all that bearish action is exceedingly bullish so uh, you fell at that rate down and you climb back even quicker and further on the way up, particularly in this uh, candle over there. There was one huge candle right in there. So if I just remove everything, you can see it. And you took out the previous localized highs. We do call this channel, We, you know, this is quite a solid channel of uh, contraction. And by the way, you have to remember during this period, the dollar index had a run below 100 and traded 99. And since then, has been probably the longest weekly charts of successive gains that has brought it right the way uh, back up. And I think it hits 107s, maybe uh, 106s. I think we had 105. Now we can go and check. But uh, you, you, so this was perpetually under pressure from a dollar bid. And you've got to remember the debt markets, the interest rates were continuing to go up. Excuse me. So we watched the bond markets very, very closely in the 5% run. And that was one we'd called for on the 10 year way uh, before that. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not a high end insight. We've got a lot of charts and a lot of videos up saying we see the 10 year running five. Uh, and that was when it was back at threes. So the, what tends to happen is when yields are going up, gold perceived as a non yielding asset gets leaned on. Uh, and you're getting the dollar getting bid as well. So you're having two forces working against the metal on the basis that, A, you're getting more, call it liquidity in the dollar, you're getting upside bid value in the dollar relative to other currencies, and you can collect a 5% coupon if you're in the 10-year treasury bill as well on top of that. So that's a difficult market to compete at on a sustained basis if the people are continuing to see that to be the case. So that is why we were in this channel. And this is quite a well-established channel. I'm just giving you a number of the interactions with this channel that we've drawn. And you can see it both at the descending, the, the, the capping descending line that I've done in red, which is the one we anticipate to have broken, which obviously it did break and then the basing ascending grind line and it's fascinating that this uh test up here threw it down with such momentum and literally turned again at that same basing descending grind line and then that represents a break with the strongest candle of them all and then that typical price behavior uh that is usually the case a return move to test and then move higher and now we stall just before the big border you know, this is almost like the Mexico-US border. I don't know what state you're in, uh, uh, Chris. Maybe I should have checked first, but maybe you're not that far south. Um, but that is a, a seminal key level, and I think it's going to wind up a little bit. So people are going to, again, have to show some patience, but the extremity of the momentum to the upside points to this being a major change. In, so the, the, the channel down, the breaking of the downside channel was to be expected to the upside. It's a bit like consider it a bull flag. You have that. It was very lengthy. However, it is definitely an upside break. And what you got, the degree of the momentum is likely to set up at some point what we would call a continuation pattern. So this coiling mechanism where you sometimes get very low volatility and it gets super tight is natural to happen just before a key fence 
fence has to be jumped. The horse has to jump the fence. He needs a run up. So he goes back and he winds up and he gets a run up and then he girds his loins and he's really up for it and he charges and then he takes the fence out. And that carryover momentum tends to see you run well through the key level of significance. So you pause before, you eye something up, it's a key level. You've also got to remember derivatives. People talk about derivatives and precious metals all the time. The logical round numbers are probably the single biggest uh, derivative strike points on uh, delivery, forward deliveries, hedging by mines, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is what I would anticipate as coming next. I think we've rever reverted back to the bullish side and we are getting ready for what will probably be a high momentum move through the 2000s. And I would expect previous highs made here to be overcome. So I'm actually saying of all the ones before that fizzled back down, I assess that there's a higher likelihood that this next one will not and will make new territory. We also for because I think it's it's the first time I'm on your channel for quite a while, we have on bigger time frames. So people need to understand when you talk technically, you talk cross time frame. You could ask me what do I expect of the gold market and I can say over the next five minutes, the next hour the next week or the next month. Uh, in short, there's structures that are set up that are relevant, but some of them take a lot longer to occur, but are far bigger. So when you hear the brassy calls that say, listen, we're going to 3000. So I think we are going to say goodbye to the 2000 as a resistance level, and it's now going to pivot to support. So once we've eventually had a good run through it, we may come back and kiss it one more time and just through it. But I assess that the next serious move up was going to take us to the threshold of the threes. And many people will say, well, how or why do you get that? And we have technical targets that are driven from, in essence, what is happening here, which was a bit of a broadening structure continuation pattern. And we expect that to take us to the threshold of 3000. So we've drawn these charts and we've shared them uh, before. It takes you to around 2900, which would be very similar to the price behavior here. Here was the reference to the the 1000 break, by the way, a technical run. Uh, it was on a smaller time frame, another technical run, another technical run. And then the fourth time you blew away. And then you literally jog almost to entirely the new next level. And we went to 1900 after we said goodbye to the uh, thousand mark. So in the same similar way, I'm expecting some degree of similarity. Only I don't think the delay between... 1900 and eventually getting back up to 1900 is going to be anywhere near as long as the 2011 peak uh, all the way through to where we are now and i think in short succession there'll be other thousands falling quite a bit quicker so it, it doesn't always repeat exactly and i think we the 3k will be a pause period but not uh nearly not decade uh like as we've just had so let me let you unpack some of that yeah, that makes sense what you're saying. And I'm curious, once we do get to that next level, obviously in the past decade, we saw, like you pointed out, 1900 and 2011, and then pulled back perhaps further than most were expecting during a period where we had interest rates so low. Let's say we get up to the $2,900, $3,000 level. What type of downside do you see from there? Does it get back to close to 2000 or what do you think is the floor once we get to that region? Yes, things are very different to compared to the 2011. You may have noted that this one did pull back all the way to 1053, which was only 53 odd dollars above the previous, excuse me, high um, from the 1900. I don't anticipate this. This is accelerating and shortening. So the breaths between each spurt get less and the pullbacks uh, smaller. Just as an aside and adding to this point, uh, Chris, I want to highlight a couple of things for you. Uh, let's just have a look at gold against other currencies. You've got to remember the current, the, the dollar is part of the story when you're talking about gold. Uh, and if you're in any other country, so you're serving an American audience, but you also probably got some international audience with you as well. Um, in terms of the euro, you know, it's at it, it's almost at an all time high here. If you look at the pound, you're banging on the door of uh, almost an all time high, and this current was higher than this, which was higher than that point. So uh, against the pound, you've been bleeding up through what would have been the two thousand dollar mark 
it's an angled line. It's not a price. In actual fact, these have been taking each other out to the high side, and we expect that. Um, if you have a look at it against the yen, my goodness, how the yen has uh, fallen as a currency, that's at an all-time high this very month. We are looking at a monthly chart and gold is doing exactly what it's supposed to do for Japanese people. Instead of sitting with uh, the little old ladies that have been buying the Bank of Japan's debt instruments, which is the traditional way, uh, the husband hands his check over and uh, she buys safety uh, in terms of government issued debt. This is what she should have been buying. By the way, we called this as an upside HVF. You mentioned an interest in the volatility and that you are an options trader. The super squeeze in volatility was an absolute sitter for yen weakness and gold was the best thing to take it. It's it's done better uh, than the dollar from this period. That literally was a 2019 break. You could have had an ounce of gold for 140,000 yen and now you're sitting at 294 so that's not that's not double it's well more you're almost at 300,000 yen you know and that's into 2019 which feels like a long time ago but actually isn't that far back so gold is absolutely doing its job against the yen if i throw up uh, i mean that's an extreme example the yen but look at the australian dollar mm -hmm. new high i mean you're not seeing these headlines are you chris in the newspaper new high this month for gold against the australian dollar you know so it's only the dollar that's really been uh, hold, uh, holding back. The Aussie dollar, let's have a look at your um, neighbors to the north, not far off on the Canadian side for new highs. And the secondary high here was higher than the previous time. So they've also got a leaky roof that is actually bleeding uh, to the upside and is not a 2000 level. They've also been uh, dripping and you're talking about a currency that's been in the oil that has a, you know, a strong oil component. And we've seen our energies have come back. Look at, uh, I'm currently in the Western Cape of South Africa. You can enjoy having a look at the South Africans, how they've done by having gold. They were the biggest producers of gold. XAU Zar, only just second off the previous high. That high is significantly higher than the previous uh, one. So gold is doing its job for every major currency. And it's sometimes something America needs to be surprised, uh, reminded of because you will be next where you will see this more obviously. Uh, you will be next. You're not going to be the one that beats it. Again, by the way, just while I'm uh, showing you the CNY, this was an absolute sitter of a technical gimme. So some people say, well, why do you trade? You know, why do you trade at all? Why don't you just be the investment guy and just stack everything? You're probably, you know, uh, well, that's a reason why, uh, a beautiful reason why you could have got gold against the Chinese currency. Look at that move. You know, you're getting in at 8,000 yuan, and then you're getting 14,000 uh, high as a high, above 14,000 as a high, which is where you are today. Uh, and that's going to run. So actually right now on the monthly chart for one of the biggest economies in the world, China, gold is at a new high. Where's all these newspaper articles saying gold at an all-time high against the one, the Australian dollar? Oh, do I need to mention the Turkish lira? Uh, that's going to be fun. Um, the Turkish lira, apart from a bad data tick there, which I'll just move out of the screen there. Let's have a look at the Turkish lira. Oh, we had a new high against the Turkish lira. Gold's doing its job for Turks too. Oh, how about our friends in India? Another massive economy that everyone sees as a, you know, a new high. Oh, hold on again. We're at a new high this month in, in gold against India. How many countries have I now given you? And how many people in population that are currently being served well by gold? So for all those that are balking at it and say, not another promise of a gold to go higher, your time is coming if you're a US audience member for gold to make new highs against the currencies. It's already doing its job for everybody else and some. Um, so hopefully that gives some of the guys some courage and that was uh, an enjoyable little remind reminder of gold's uh, performance so far. Yeah, well, I appreciate you pointing that out because like you said, we certainly have seen it hit new highs in many of the other currencies. Of course, as I'm sure you're well familiar, us us Americans were not always the most patient bunch yet. Um, like you like you said, we've seen that rally in the dollar, which has had a lot to do with things. Curious, how do you distinguish between the trading patterns and the fundamentals? And in terms of the move that you're expecting, is that going to be a matter of needing the Fed to finally say, all right, we're done hiking rates or 
getting to the point where they finally cut rates, if that is what you're expecting? Is it going to need some sort of <laughs> fundamental driver to really push us through that? Or is that something that you think just the the way the trading patterns line up could do it even without a fundamental event behind it? So um, my uh, take on this is hard formed over many, many years. And the I, I refer to charts as God foot, God's footprints in the beach sand, you know, uh, and this is, uh, the, although the players are not certainly godly, if we're in the, maybe I should rephrase that, but um, the, 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 in terms of truth, that is my uh, ask, ap absolute truth. People with money move markets. People with big, big money and knowledge and high levels of, call it certainty, or very high on balance of probability, usually move markets bigly. So in, in actual form, the chart is always king because the smartest, wealthiest money is the one that is predominantly making the largest contribution. And as retail, we are price takers. You know, you could tell me... Um, Gold's 1,820 today, and I'd be a buyer. And you could tell me it's 2,010, and I'd be a buyer. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the guy that says no. It shouldn't be 2,010. It should be 1,810. I, uh, you know, I want to buy. We're market. We're actually price takers. Uh, yes, there's a bit of our spread, and we can put a limit order and all of these clever things. But at the end of the day, the market is being moved by scale, and that scale is inherently a lot of um, wisdom in it. So here's an interesting thought that I'd like your viewers to watch. And I discussed this on another channel, but I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, if you look at Jim Grant, who's the interest rate observer, a very interesting guy, uh, I call him the grandfather clock of Fed observance, uh, lovely, a very a cracking humor. Um, and he's, he used to do cartoons of the search for yield, in essence, you know, you'd have this man dying of thirst walking through the desert, you know, the typical stereotype. This has been the search for yield. The search for yield has gone on since the Falkers peak spike, all the way through a debt market that, in my opinion, turned on the March 2020 events. And we said so in 2020. We, we had two years of people saying buy bonds, wear diamonds uh, to us. Uh, and now suddenly everybody else is starting to think twice about this thing, the debt instrument. Now that we've seen 5% on the US 10 year, uh, which again has had HVF setups. And it might be fun to show you the debt. But the, what's actually happening, what people don't understand is as this is going on, uh, the, the rates going up, uh, a US citizen, is there's a trillion on credit card debt. The average rate is 21%, by the way. Um, there's uh, new home loan purchases are being done at much higher interest rates. Uh, all sorts of things of hardship. And then you're looking at the cost. I mean, Coco's hit, a, I think it's a 40-year high as one of the softs, as just an example. But you've actually had sugar. You've had all forms of softs and agries running live cattle. You've had all sorts of commodity bulls. Uh, this is all part of the currency destruction. And what is the shadow of the currency? If the currency is a human being that stands, what is the shadow that it costs that every currency has? It's the debt because money is borrowed into existence. It's like a T-bill accounting, the liability uh, and the asset that uh, sits there. Gold doesn't have that. You hold that gold. There's no T-bill accounting. It's yours and you hold it. Uh, and that is uh, simply, it's a sort of uni account, you know, it's mine. <laughs> and that's, there's a lot of value to that. And possession is nine tenths of the law. So watch where you keep it, but let's not get sidetracked by that. So since the March, 2020 events, it's our supposition that the overall theme that Jim Grant was so uh, humorously uh, depicting way back then um, of the search for yield as the rates continue to get lower, this is all well pre the 2020 collapse, he was like that, um, has pivoted from a search from yield environment to capital preservation. And, and why? Why has it become a capital preservation? Why do you no longer have to care for yield? You need to care for capital preservation because all the risks are to the downside. So the tax takes are coming down at the worst time for government. They are increasing the rates that they have to pay to the banking cartel that was allowed to borrow the first dollar into existence. So they're having to take more of US taxpayers' money to service interest. They're having to do all these things on a greater scale. And at the same time, those same consumers and the, 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 the retail businesses that 
rely on consumer expenditure, all have reduced profits, reduced tax payments, reduced everything. So you're now getting an even greater degree of need for issuance at a significantly higher rate. So you are going into a parabola of new debt issuance, which has all got to be monetized. China sold off recent news, you know, absolute uh, unteen billions uh, this last month of US debt. Uh, and you're actually facing a situation there are no buyers. This was the cause behind the British pension crisis. They needed to sell because they didn't have sufficient yield. They had people had to pay pensions to, and there was no bid uh, of sufficient scale for them to actually uh, distribute some of their pension holdings. A, they should have been paying it out of yield, which hasn't been sufficient. So they're an actuarial nightmare. B, they should be able to sell it and get some hard cash anyway to pay their immediate short-term needs uh, whilst they muddle on uh, and don't acknowledge the fact that long-term they're not going to be able to sustain the pay. But that's happening in the British pension system in March that saw uh, you know a prime minister thrown out and a financial minister. But the problem is there's no bid. And you have this extreme example of this in Japan, by the way, where they had yield curve control. And we're now calling for 1.6% percent they are letting it bleed out in japan too in other words every increase in the rates people have to remember that's a devaluation in the assets there's so much of it there's nobody who wants it there's a lack of liquidity on the buy side for it it is devaluing who wants the hot potato to burn their hands nobody wants to hold it so what you're moving away from is it doesn't matter that it pays five percent the fact of the matter is you could lose 30% in a year on your capital, and that won't necessarily be even be the end of it, and you won't even be able to get out of it. Yet it's the safe investment. I did an MBA, and the benchmark for doing a business was the risk-free rate as a US T-bill. Uh, and everything else, if you aren't earning more than that, you just put the money in the T-bill and earn it. Well, it doesn't hold. It's not risk-free at all. There's an absolute proliferation. Things that aren't scarce aren't valuable. If everyone drives a Bugatti, how much will I pay for one? Um, the point of the, the matter here is that there is an absolute splurge of debt out there. So the game becomes capital preservation. And the fact that it will go up, mainly on account of everything else falling down so far in valuation, the fact that it'll go up if compared to a fiat currency will more than compensate for a piddly yield uh, and definitely make people more comfortable against losing 40 or 50, 60 percent and uh, potentially to zero, by the way, on debt valuation. And we will have probably before that zero gets hit, get sold a new system with uh, another lifespan to run in for another 80 years. Uh, only it's going to have a lot more surveillance uh, finance type features in it. And, you know, God forbid us, but I won't go too black pill down there. This is gold time and hour. That said, they know there are people like us thinking about us, and we have to keep thinking how they're going to make this bad for us. So just doing the gold investment is the right thing, but it's not necessarily the only thing. And I don't know if you wanted to explore that a little bit further, but let me let you unpack some of that. Well, a lot of good points you had in there, and it seems like we are approaching that point where it's not just gold and silver investors who are concerned about these things. I mean, we even with the surge in yields and 5% on a 30-year bond, like I heard you point out in one of your videos, uh, is CPI the greatest measure of inflation? I think we would agree not. So, I mean, that's with the massive supply that's coming forward, plus the inflation rates that are already still pretty elevated, even following the rate hikes. So, yeah, I think people are becoming quite concerned about that. And you mentioned what's going on in England, where they had the crisis with the gilts last year, and now we're seeing rates higher than that. Um Although before we get to silver, yeah, I would like to hear, uh, you, you were mentioning how gold isn't the only way to be looking at this and any thoughts on other things that people should be considering or, or looking into at this point? I think gold's one of the best things you can do. Uh, my point was it just owning it isn't your full safety. I think you have to think and game theory how government gets to strip you of your wealth. You have to view government as the enemy that this is a war. 
This is a financial war. It could also explode into a social war. You would argue there's already quite a lot of social war divisiveness already going on with reference to this reset. You're going to have more taxes, more payments for utilities, more expensive energy, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a full-blown extraction shell game that sees a certain group of people want to own everything, and that's not good enough to win for them like that. They need everybody else to have nothing and they be thereby totally controlled. Um, in other words, you are ward of state. Your welfare it will come with conditions and you will comply. Uh, so that is the ultimate power. Um, and unfortunately, all systems, even if they weren't designed to go there from the outset, once you get put on a certain trajectory to avoid eventually getting a blowback revolution and being threatened yourself, you need to keep uh, restricting the people that could be your greatest threat. So we have to view it with that as a trajectory that is now in play. And with that said, you know, they're going to ask you to register your gold and then they're going to tokenization. If you listen to uh, uh, think of BlackRock, in terms of the great delight. I mean, there's been a lot of Bitcoin and the ETF. This is, again, as I say, a status creation, in my opinion. There's no one who created this thing and disappeared in the wilderness. I think that's fairy tales for adults, but never mind. Um, what happened uh, is, in essence, his great delight is that, you know, we'll cross borders. This is very New World order uh, type talk. We'll cross borders. You won't fall under the jurisdiction of individual governments. He's pitching it almost as, as a freedom. What he's actually saying is the block blockchain that can be fully scrutinized um, will have a, a global tracking system uh, in essence in terms of all that you do and they want tokenization so he's very pro tokenization the concept of having an nft or a token that represents all assets so you would have a token for the home that you live in uh, chris and it would be pre-packed with all the information the history the title deeds and the land registry and i could buy your token and thereby become your landlord and i think that's one of the grave dangers we face being turned into a tenant in your own home uh look they won't do that in a, a week or a day or a month um and you're going to what but i think all assets are going to seek to have a token and they're going to say it's for your safety you know if anyone ever steals your stuff they can't sell it it's got to be registered to the token it's a proxy they wish to create digital proxies for everything you own this way when they print up however many tokens of whatever CBDC coin is the global world order's primary one, they can actually be purchases of everything and lend, rent it back to you. And that's how they keep everyone on a subscription model. And you have to see that subscription models have, have superseded purchase models. So you see it in Microsoft and the, and the cloud was all designed to rent uh, Excel, rent Word, rent this, not buy, you know, there's no more purchases. In other words, people want a newitized income. And it's not people, us, it is the corporatocracy. This fascist corporatocracy is very good at extracting this. So the minute you own metals, they're going to A, say, we just want to know and it'll be for your safety. And if anyone steals your gold bars, we'd be able to recoup it for you and the serial number and we wouldn't let it. It's kind of like uh, you know, it's kind of like having a cam, me having a camera outside your house. I'm just keeping, you know, you safe in your home, Chris. Um, but in essence, they first send the man with a clipboard and you own up to all you have. And then that becomes, well, well, you know, others have suffered and you bought this pet rock and it's been, you know, you've done rather well. And there's a special once off tack. We're only going to do this once or it's temporary or it's listen and da, 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 da. And then it happens once, but then they have to milk that cow again. And maybe who knows, you know, I, some people will say I'm being far fetched. Uh, the, the, the end of the gold standard was a temporary measure. As you know, this word temporary by governments is the biggest lie. So they just have to get that wedge in the door and they'll do anything they like. So I actually am a fan of what I would say black off-grid gold, which simply means your own gold. The minute you, you put something, you inventoryize it, you write something down and it gets digitized, um, I start to feel uh, cautious. So sometimes people get upset with me because I'm making them nervous. I'm just game theorying out how these rather smart people that are doing something at a very big scale, they are very aware that there are gold bugs and sound money advocates. They go out of their way to not be talking about the fact that gold is at 
monthly highs against all the currencies I just listed for you. I mean, show me a newspaper that gave you that information. Um, so they, they're they very good at suppressing and controlling narrative. And I just think you have to do even more. You need it to be quiet. You need to, uh, you need to maybe have a plan uh, in place in advance of some of these happening. Because if someone suddenly catches you and doorsteps you and say, hey, hey, we're here on your doorstep and we need this. Uh, most people's net reaction is compliance because you just go oh okay you're from the government you've got a fancy badge or id uh, i'll go along with that i suppose i have to and he said yeah no no you need to do this um you might actually not want to or with part of your stack not want to so there's other things to think about i wasn't so much referring to other assets i just think um you haven't seen the totalitarianism that uh, is probably planned for us play out in its fullest yet yeah, it certainly is kind of them to keep us safe in so many pleasant and, and fuzzy ways. And <laughs> uh, and I think that's one of the things that's really concerning people. Obviously, we hear a lot about the digital currencies and the, uh, the Fed currencies that are getting ready to be rolled out, and which is what leaves a lot of people mm -hmm. wanting to get their money out of the system, going into physical gold and silver. And I think greatly so because uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess this has been going on centuries, not just decades, but certainly in the last couple of decades, ever since uh, September 11th, we've, we've seen a rapid escalation of some of these Orwellian policies, which um, leave a lot of people concerned. So appreciate you pointing that out. And perhaps one other one, of course, I couldn't let you leave here without digging into silver and might add that you had an interesting call a couple of weeks ago suggesting that we might see silver dip below $20. And we didn't get all that far off, went below $21. And since then has had a rebound back up into almost hitting 24 last week, selling off a little bit over the past couple of days. But would love if you could pull up the silver chart and also touch on the $30 level, which has appeared to be a bit of a line in the sand over the past couple of years. I think a lot of people are curious what happens when silver finally gets over $30. And I've heard several of my guests suggest that that's a line that is being heavily defended. I tend to agree with that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And if you want to throw in any analysis of should we see a $50 silver price again in our near or not too distant future um anything you could touch on there would be great yes certainly so let's just start with the shorter term stuff because that's more just by the by and uh was event driven let me just grab the share button again um and and say we did contemplate and put on uh and as yet it's not actually stopped out because i was very lucky i got a particularly good fill so we don't tend to chase markets uh we leave limit orders in we always say don't uh, don't run after markets. You've got to prepare to let trades walk from you. This was the structure that we didn't like that was suggesting that it was a big fall and gold also sell off very br brutally as a result of that. That was this event over here. Um, and uh, funny enough, I put a limit. I I'd, I'd missed. I put a limit there and I got filled on this wick here. So the market, and that by the way, was non-farm payrolls. You got a rally, I think, just before right. and then it reversed horribly. Um, so this is what we call a basing ascending grind line. And typically these get run. Now the target implied for this suggested actually that you could go to $20. In the end, you got to 20 and a half. So we were correct about the fall and the sell off, uh, but it didn't go uh, all the way to 20. We we're a half a dollar shy on that, but we did get short on 23 on a very fortunate wick run uh, that goes and the stop loss is there, which it actually isn't stopped out. And it's slightly, believe it or not, that short on silver is still in the money uh, slightly because we're looking a little softer now. Remember the dollar is getting a bit of a bid now on the Dixie uh, and I feel it's a falling wedge and I don't think dollar strength is going to be soft, uh, dollar weakness is going to be soft for long. I can show you that on a similar small time frame, but your question is about the short term on silver and then the, the macro. So let me deal with that first. Uh, so that broke down. Um, I didn't close it. I was out riding and it, it came all the way back. I went into the red there and I'm a tiny bit in. But that was a classic case of a technical short that was almost a hedge, a small hedge, because I do the trading on much smaller scale. Remember the pyramid description, your investment base must be uh, a lot bigger. I'm fortunate to actually have 1,000 ounce 
uh, uh, holdings as well, a couple of those, uh, and right the way across through to single ounce uh, uh, holdings. And I suggest everybody else to uh, as much get as much as they can, even if they accumulate monthly. Just we have like you know you can put a fifty dollars a a month and you can uh, still grab an ounce. But anyway, that sell off has occurred. It hasn't stopped out, but there could be a little bit of a soft spell again. I would probably if it got back into profit close it because I don't see it now going to the uh, 21. So gold, we treat as the God market, you know, he's the boss. And that rejection was so strong. Um, and that means that move largely is over. So that tactical trade had its window. I should have been on the screens. And when this was reversing, I should have been getting out uh, on it. But it is what it is where it is now. Let's have a look at the uh, bigger time frame. There'll be some people who will be very angry that I shorted. Uh, I'm sorry uh, if you are. Uh, don't mean to wind anybody up, uh, but we are traders as well. Uh, and it's a great way to build more silver if you can see a short coming in. So this is the a six monthly chart. So every candle here, it represents half a year. And this the reason why I like this time frame, which is too many will be a touch bizarre, um, is that it captures the 80s and it also captures the 11 high right the way through to where we are. And this is your $50 question that you've dropped in because we've been kind of at the doorstep of $50 on two previous occasions meaningfully. That was A, the 80s, 79 into 80. That's over there that many people talk about. Many of many current bullion investors may not even have been born then. I do remember that period. And then 2011. So, you know, when I said uh, once, twice, three times a lady in honor of Lionel Richie, I do think the run-up to the 3,000 level, because we also had targets on the gold-silver ratio. We might not have time for that this particular occasion, um, but on the gold-silver ratio, we see uh, a certain down move that will bring you to around 65. So in the event of gold being at uh, 3,000 uh, and the gold-silver ratio having dropped to 65, you would get a $45 to $50 range silver. So that would be what I'd call the third time as a lady, but not yet a man. Uh, sorry, ladies, I don't mean to demean you in any way. Uh, it's more uh, joking with the transgender uh, cult. But anyway, over here, this line, then this level, if you are uh, here, I would expect us to sell off again. So the same thing you asked, when we get 3000, would we get a pullback? How meaningful would it would be? My answer was A, I would expect one. B, I don't expect it to have any of the duration of the previous bull markets by any degree, but you would get one. It's a psychological level. And I would expect the same if we made 45. You could come back down to, say, 32. But then for silver, as in for gold, when gold starts its next move up for five and beyond, potentially, I would expect silver to break 50. And then this is going to be a super, super spike. This is where uh, uh, people will be making their uh, retirement and their next generation's money uh in the move that would follow that again it would break you'd probably revisit but then i would expect something pretty violent uh so if gold goes 10 and silver goes back down to a 30 or even uh, double digits just like 10 wow you could be you could be in a different zone you could be a thousand dollars uh silver uh on that and that would be super exciting so this is an ascending triangle technically and if gold does the, the break of the 2000 mark, it's very hard not to see uh, a move back up to the 45. Uh, I can tell you also where I am now. Everybody, uh, thanks to a, a badly run government, is having uh, load shedding and power outages, et cetera. So there's generators everywhere. Everyone is getting solar. And everyone, a lot of the, the, you know, the high income and the middle income homes already have solar. And solar, as you know, is stuffed with silver, so much so that it's even a theft market now, stealing people's solar panels um, if you're not at your home for an extended period. So you have to secure your solar panels and put them on a roof where they can be seen, but they can't be stolen. Uh, and that's a massive amount of silver. And they're expecting, I just watched an article today, <laughs> they're expecting the highest demand for silver in solar panels mainly driven by solar panels industrially next year to, uh, in uh, 2024. So you've got to think about all of that. You've got to think how many ounces are above ground. You've got to think how uh, how silver mining is 
a non-attractive entry point with all the BlackRock, uh, you know, the ESG stuff. Um, it's very hard to get financing now. It's more expensive. Guess what? That becomes a barrier to entry. That is your future mega shoot, which also we got with a little bit of oil. You saw how quickly oil rebounded and it ran 130. You were at zero in March 2020 and you did oil 130. So now for me, uh, I would actually favor Rather than oil, I would favor the metals because this is a monetary crisis. And the problem with oil specifically, not so much natural gas or uranium, the problem with oil is that there's a consumer element. It's purchasing, it's delivery, it's packaging. If we get the hardships that goes with a monetary failure, you will actually have disinflation to a degree. Although the currencies will be devaluing, oil will not have the same degree of upside during that period that a real, real preservation of capital golden uh, silver. So you can actually put on a gold versus oil trade if you don't want to have the dollar in it and you can hedge out your dollar. So there's some interesting things that we've done in the trading space or just keep it simple and be investment gold and silver, which many of your people are already doing. So I don't know if that's interesting and if there's anything you want to drill down on there, uh, Chris. Yeah, perhaps the last thing to touch on, you did mention the gold to silver ratio in there, which has remained on the higher end of its range. Any thoughts on how far that drops uh maybe we can look a little bit further out into the future um obviously you mentioned some of the supply and demand fundamentals for silver which at least suggest the possibility of us running into a supply issue at some point uh certainly if we're going to go forward with these green mandates as suggested which i wonder if that's even physically possible given the dynamics of getting silver and some of these other metals out of the ground but if, if they do continue these mandates could lead to some issues because at current silver price, it's not really bringing a lot of money into the silver mining space. So um, with all that said, any thoughts on what you see happening with the gold to silver ratio? And is that something that people really should be keeping an eye on or not as much of significance at this point? I always find relative valuations very important. I showed you how people that only look at the dollar-based uh, price would lose spirit about their gold and silver investments. But once we did just other currencies, we call this the 360 degree look around full cross valuation, you actually get to see a far bigger picture. Uh, and that in actual fact, gold is in fact doing exactly what it should be doing for all the people in just about every world in the rest uh, of the world outside of the dollar. So uh, we do love cross valuations um, and the gold silver ratio, again, coincident with the March 2020 events, you had the biggest blow off in the gold silver ratio. Markets end on a blow off spike. Those that are familiar and remember the dot com boom, most watching this will be, uh, will know that you have a blow off when nobody else cares. It's a technical phenomenon. And you also get final capitulations into lows. You can see it here. And blow offs are the end of bull markets. Now, bull market in the gold silver ratio is actually bearish for. Uh, metals. So we want to see a bear market on the gold silver ratio. Uh, and this structure over us suggests a head and shoulder for us that we've been talking about for some scale. Uh, and it's a macro, it's a very big time frame one. Again, these things don't happen overnight. But it's our opinion that you're in a, a, a listing broadening structure on the right shoulder. So that's this. And that this dotted red line when it gives up, uh, the next major move will be to the neckline of 65, which is why I was mentioning if you do the maths, <laughs> excuse me, and gold's at 3,000 and you've dropped to a 65 uh, neckline, you'll bounce here a little bit, I would imagine, and then you'd spill. We actually have a journey A down to 32 and right below. And I have actually done a video where it's my personal assessment that such will be the extremity of this move that you could actually get single digit gold silver ratios. You've got to remember um, the mining levels is one is to eight. So, you know, you could get a uh, sub. So we've said, uh, you know, 9.999, all the nines is a possibility on the final capitulation. The bigger you move to the upside, and this was the highest ever, you were, you were out at 128 odd, Chris, uh, here on the gold silver ratio. You mean you had to count out. Imagine if you've got a stack counting out 128 ounces of silver just to get that one baby ounce of gold in terms of how they're being pulled out of the ground that doesn't hold 
it doesn't stand and it's going to turn and it will overshoot markets overshoot the 128 is a ridiculous overshoot watch the ridiculous overshoot the other way is my big question and that's why i say four digit uh it's silver is indeed a possibility and single digit gold silver ratio in time that's not a prediction for tomorrow next week or next month but in time and it will be a disorderly time i'm afraid to say it will be associated with a lot of probably very difficult situations and there could in fact be a large degree of mass distraction by other geopolitical events because the last thing they want you to be watching is the collapse of their financial system so they might before all of that is fully played out do a quick you know forced reset and push everyone into a new system whereby once you calculate and you, you remove all basis of comparison and if you ever compare to what will then be known as the old dollar you will eventually see that but you won't actually physically get to trade it at that level uh, it's quite possible that you get your thousand dollar an ounce but that will be called the old paper dollar and now you'll have your new whatever whatever and you'll have to do the mass from one to the other to see that you actually made it so they can r force a wedge into uh, that event so that it does it does end up occurring but not in a way that you get to have the satisfaction of being able to trade it directly uh so that's something else to bear in mind when we make these predictions um but yeah that should get the silver bulls going uh and really optimistic and i feel that's as a real outcome of occurring it's typical of price behavior markets are inherently unstable and when they overreact and we only have to pour into our, our single digit oil call in march 2020 and the subsequent top at 130 you can see how you overreacted to the downside to overpump, and this will be uh, something similar. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and well said. Obviously, uh, a lot of silver investors are wondering when some of these fundamentals, like you mentioned, the mining supply ratio and some of these other things that seem to suggest different outcome than what we actually currently have, when that comes into play. And <clears throat> I guess maybe that's the curse of the silver investor is that by the time that happens or some of these other things in the world that we've talked about and you've detailed in today's call, are they happening and um, leaves people a bit concerned, although at least if they are happening, it'd be good to have our silver then. So Francis, I sure appreciate everything you shared here. Uh, it's great to get a mix of macro, the trading and also some of the world events uh, all put in here. So I thank you for that. And perhaps in wrapping up, can you let folks know uh, if they'd like to stay in touch with you and your trading and some of the services you offer, where they could find you? Thank you for that, uh, Chris. And I appreciate the time with your lovely audience. To them, I would all say this is a wealth polarizing event. We did a major video. It got a lot of views highlighting in 17 that a systemic major polarizing. That means you go up, or you're going down. There is no staying in the middle classes anymore, or the upper middle classes, wherever you are, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and as a result of that, you and there are many forces that want you to be part of the grand mass that will be pushed down. Uh, so you have to really think and focus. However, there are true opportunities, investment and trading, that will be in a totally different financial environment than any typical advisor is even accustomed to. So traditional financial advice of security and safety and bonds is exactly what you don't want. Everything that sounds counterintuitive is probably what you do want in this current environment. We focus on the wealth opportunities that are being brought about by the systemic reset and introduction of a new system, which we'd rather not uh, see happen, but is happening. We've accepted that and we decided if we are to be subjected to the system, we wish to be wealthy in the system to buy us some freedom. You'll be buying other people's carbon credits to still go on holidays and uh, trips if you have that wealth. Uh, and so that is our speciality. It involves long-term trading. We are not day traders and chasing a, a cent or a tip. I don't sit on nine screens uh, all day and fry my eyes. Um, we are wealth builders for the reset season. We discuss this on our YouTube channel, The Market Sniper. Please feel free to sub and have a look at that, by the way, um, as, as you wish and watch our content. We try to be a bit entertaining. We don't mean, uh, hopefully not insulting, but keep a light heart. There is a mental psyop to all of this. And I'm here to tell you, you guys were chosen to see this through. That's because you are big enough and strong enough. 
you are, can still do many things with, even if it was limited amount of time available, that will put you in a substantially better position. Taking action is mental health. Um, and it's the docility, it's the depression, it's the inactivity and inertia that uh, makes you feel helpless. We take active action all the time to help people transition this with the golden arch that is the metals uh, that will take you from the old rickety train to the mono line that is this new system we have been sold. Uh, and we aim to prepare and help everyone through this and build wealth. And there will be major moves in the markets. And can I remind, some markets fall faster than they go up. This bond market took 40 years to inflate. It can go down in four to uh, almost zero. Uh, there are real opportunities in that. And I would take pride in actually taking wealth from that and converting it into metals for both myself and community members. There are many other opportunities similar. Join us on the YouTube channel if you like it and you want to talk to us. We have no salesmen, just existing community members that will talk to you if you choose to book a call. We'd love to have you. If you're reset-minded, you own your own outcomes and you recognize that this is a seminal moment in our lifetimes. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I'm also on Twitter under the Market Sniper as well, by the way, for the Goldies if they want to follow there. Well, we'll have both of those links in the description field below. And love what you said there about taking action on the things that are going on. Obviously, it, it can be heavy reading through some of the things that are happening in the world. And that's uh, often a daily battle to see that, but not just sit back and say, well, there's nothing I can do. And appreciate that you're you're really focused on taking the circumstances we have and making good outcomes out of that. So really appreciate the time you shared with us today. I think this is going to be helpful for people and great to finally meet you. And we'll have to catch up and do this again soon. Seems like there will be no shortage of market events happening in the next couple of months and years. And just appreciate all you're doing. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you again soon, my friend. Absolute pleasure. And the final word, get all debt out of your uh, life if you can. The spike in interest rates possibility is a very, very dangerous one. Please do that uh, if you are exposed uh, as best you can. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Great, great to chat with you. All right. Thank you. Francis Hunt, the Market Sniper. We'll talk to you soon, my friend.